Okay. Hopefully this is working. In a minute or two, I will start going through the topic for this evening, which is uh, kenosis. Um, I did post the notes. They're on Facebook. Um, I think they went up at about 6.30 p.m. And as always, after a while, I will put this onto um, YouTube and the notes will be on the parish website. I see we've got uh, one or two people already live there. That's fabulous. Uh, give me just a second while I quickly see if I'm there and if things are working. Yep. Awesome. Okay. So I hope you have the notes. Um, and uh, as I said, tonight's topic is kenosis. <clears throat> and where kenosis comes from is in one sense, uh, it's part of the attempt to answer the question, how do we understand the humanity and the divinity of Christ? And uh, that is, <laughs> it's a tricky question. Um, oh, and Reg Poston says he has the notes. Uh, fabulous. So in the early church, there were many people who argued uh, around the question, what do we do? How do we understand what it means to say of Jesus that Jesus is fully human and fully divine? And that's, a, as I said, a fair and complicated question. One of those answers came uh, through a, a word, kenosis, which is based on Paul's writings to the Philippians in chapter 2, verse 7. Uh, and in, in 6 to 8, and I'll read it for you quickly. He says, Paul writes, writing of Christ, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Um, and what I did is I just grabbed uh, Strong's. So if, you, if you're not familiar with Strong's, what it is, is it's a cross-reference where every word in the Bible, basically, is you can look up its Greek or Hebrew origin and uh, how it's uh, translated, um, where else you find it, those sorts of things. And the word Paul uses is the word uh, keno or kenu, um, which means I empty or I take away the content, or perhaps I even, I make unreal. Um, and so from this word comes this idea that in order to achieve fully human and fully divine, what Christ does in the incarnation, or demonstrates in the incarnation, is that he empties himself of some of his divinity, which is, you know, in the way Paul constructs it, it's kind of this beautiful uh, poetic thing. Um, and so obviously the first thing that came to my mind was a cartoon. And the cartoon is based around the transfiguration. If you don't have it, uh, I'll, I'll describe it for you. I'll describe it for you. So Jesus is talking to his disciples. He says, got to go, dudes. Don't forget what I taught you. And then you, in the next panel, you see his, all you see is the feet dangling through the car, through the thing there. He says, see you in the funny papers. Bye-bye, boss. Bye. And the disciples gather around. They go, so what have we learned? And one of the other disciples says, yeah, pretty much it's love God and love your neighbor. And then one of the next panel, one of the disciples says, well, that seems pretty simple. I don't see how we can miss that. 
Uh oh. Here come the theologians. <laughs> and as a person who is very fond of theology, I resemble that remark. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, there's a sense of there's an element of truth in that remark. I assure you. Um, you know, part of being a theologian is about trying to dig into uh, scripture and what we might be able to say about God in the best way possible. But that does mean sometimes you just end up getting in very lost and confused. So having Paul propose, in a sense, in Philippians, the answer, self-emptying. The question is, of what did Christ empty himself? And uh, there were a couple of sort of proposed answers. Um, uh, one of them was that Christ was emptied of divinity. So that in Jesus we have an, uh, God, but whose divinity is subtracted. Now there are some problems with that. Uh, one of the problems, of course, is that the way it's phrased is that the emptying isn't self-emptying. It's not that Christ empties uh, Christ's self, it's that Christ was emptied. And obviously that's problematic. Uh, but what's also problematic is we then run into that sentence of uh, fully human, fully divine. One of the other things that was proposed, and neither of these were accepted by the way, um, was that Christ was emptied of humanity. And technically that's deceit deceitism. Um, just think of deceit. In that it, just because they sound the same. Uh, it's about appearing human, but perhaps not necessarily being human. So it's the appearance of humanity. Um, and that, of course, is problematic. Once again, it runs into the fully human, fully divine. Most of the answers, most of the answers tended to be that what Christ emptied Christ's self of were the things that were relational rather than um, attributes of. And so the example there that I've got is omnipotence. So, so one of the things we say about the nature of God, well, some people say about the nature of God is that God is omnipotent, omnipotent. Uh, but we then run into questions of just, you know, how powerful or omniscient, all-knowing, how knowledgeable was Jesus, especially if we take into consideration that to be human means to learn and grow and to have that poured out. Well, there's a question, isn't there? So anyway, um, what tended to be seeing was that the omnipotence and the omniscience were perhaps emptied. But not the character, the love, the benevolence, the goodness, the kindness, the creativeness. And so, in a sense, the, the, the omnipotence and the omniscience are in relation to the other. So, you know, the question is, uh, you know, how powerful is God? Could God make an entire universe? See, it, it's, it's in relation to the universe. Could God uh, make all human beings behave themselves appropriately? It's in relation to human beings. Um, could Do you see how the, it's those sorts of omnipotence questions? And we, we don't see depicted in Jesus omnipotence in that sense. There are moments where we see Jesus um, being part of a miracle. A miracle is the free will gracious offering of God. But it, it's not a kind of omnipotence or omniscience. Uh, what's not emptied out is the self-giving love. Now, one of the things to look at is if we kind of go back and we look at that Philippians, and in chapter, in verse 6, not chapter 6, verse 6, Andrew, it says, though he was in the form of God. And one way of translating that is not like although or despite the fact, but perhaps because he was in the form of God, Christ emptied himself. 
And so kenosis becomes uh, not something that Christ does, you know, to put aside his godliness, but rather as an earnest and honest expression of that godliness. That kenosis is one of those characteristics of God baked into the DNA of God if you will obviously that's a metaphor so just like we'd say that God is loving it's it's in the very nature of God we might also say that God is kenotic it's in the very nature of God to be self-emptying and so that's one way to kind of find our, ourselves approaching that question of the dual nature of Christ. Of course, as will happen with these sorts of things, the question then is picked up by theologians. <laughs> um, and, and as I said, you know, if we talk about God as being in God's very nature, canotic, the question is when would other places be that we might see kenosis being an expression of God? Um, now, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a German theologian and um, quite famous, uh, you know, um, wrote in a number of areas, uh, impacted modern theology hugely, not least because uh, he was in a position where he died for his faith. Uh, so he was a thinking person, passionately engaged in faith in the world, uh, challenged the church in many respects uh, in ways that it needed to be, it needs still to be challenged. So Bonhoeffer writes uh, that only a weak God could truly be effective in the world. Now, his ideas are never fully fleshed out. He, he doesn't get the chance, I suppose, to really kind of nut out what he means. He, he's in prison. Um, German gods, all the rest of it, <laughs> give a guy a break. But um, he, his writings kind of reinvigorate, uh, at least in the West, the language around kenosis. And the reason I say in the West is I'll kind of come and pick up some of the orthodox stuff in a bit. So it becomes this really important theological concept to explore in later times. Uh, and you'll see that there's a graphic there um, in, in the notes. And part of that is that it's a, um, I'm trying to remember the name of the book, I should have put it in there. Uh, the work of love and creation, sort of canotic love. And um, it's a collection of writers who are working with science and theology through this, through the lens of, um, or well, the science and theology of creation through the lens of kenosis. So, for in that context, the, um, the the idea is that in creating, what we see is God's self-emptying, and people who are from that school will actually tell you that, and I. I think they've got a point, that this self-emptying picture of God allows theologians to, to bring a new lens, a fresh lens, and an important lens to a, a whole range of questions. So one of those questions might be things like uh, the integrity of nature. And what that means is, is that um, if we look at creation, we see certain consistency, and we call that consistency the laws of physics and science and things like that. Uh, but we also have this picture, scripturally, of God creating the universe. And early scientists, in fact, for them, uh, this kind of, they explored the universe with the expectation that it would be understandable because uh, God who created it created it to be understood and explored. And so how do, you, how do you reconcile these? And to have a picture of God in God's creation 
in the in the very act of creating being at least partially about self contraction about self emptying so that there is space for uh, the universe that isn't just swamped by the divinity of God. And that's a beautiful loving act. And, and you know, you, you, you can think about it in a number of ways. But just to have God imaged and imagined as stepping back to create the space for the universe. And then, in a sense, stepping back yet again in the creation of humanity and in the questions that we would ask. So part of what this does is, is that, you know, it, it starts to point to uh, ways of thinking through creation, the problem of evil and suffering, uh, and the, work, the way that evolution works even. Because if we see uh, kenosis as being the mechanism by which God creates, well, then what we are invited into is that it's an ongoing process that God is continuing to create by, by pouring out God's creative divinity. But also God is, is continuing, in a sense, to create by not interfering too far. And so we have the, the universe that is creative because God is creative and it's God's essence that's poured out. Um, but it's not a clockwork because God is choosing not to be kind of a clockwork um, controller of things. Uh, and we, you know, and we, we kind of get this as a picture. Kenosis is a very powerful image. Um, and I came across this uh, beautiful quote by uh, theologian Jürgen Moltmann. Uh, in 1985, uh, it says that God withdraws himself from himself to himself in order to make creation possible. So it's this, uh, I might disagree with Jürgen Moltmann about the use of gendered language for God, but that's a, you know, neither here nor there. So, but, you know, you can see that Jürgen Moltmann's talking about there's this contraction of the presence of God to create the space for uh, creation. Beautiful concept there. Beautiful concept. Okay, so I'm going to keep going. Um, because remember Paul's letter to the Philippians that we kind of started this whole thing off on? Paul wasn't really trying to uh, write a theological treatise. Uh, in fact, what he was trying to do was to propose um, a Christian ethic. So he was saying, how should Christians behave? What's the model we should be using? And so he talks about Christ as the model. And he says, look at how uh, amazing Christ is. He was in the form of God, you know, form... Uh, the power, the, the glory of God, and yet didn't choose to, to uh, and the NRSV quote translates as exploited, uh, you know, doesn't choose to exploit that, but empties himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. So we have the form of God, the, the, the all-powerful, glorious, magnificent, meeting, not by pulling up a slave, but by coming down to the form of the lowest. So it's, 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 a, it's an ethic that very much uh, flattens the difference between, because what it says is, you know, the difference between you and me is nothing. And that what a Christian should do is that a Christian should... Um, empty themselves of pride and, uh, and, and arrogance and be humble. Uh, and, and the exemplar, Christ, is humility and obedience to the message of the love of God to the point of death, even death on a cross. And crucifixion was, of course, uh, the, 
in many way in many ways theologically the the worst possible death so kenosis is not just a christological issue uh, as I said um, so kenosis when implied then to human beings remember back in Genesis uh, human beings are made in the image and likeness of God God breathes into us we are inspired by God that's what it means to breathe in inspire you know expire perspire inspired breathed in inspiration um, inspirited by God we are inspired by God um, and so when it uh, kenosis then in, in regards to, to, to you and I to humanity is a process of continual and a, there's a technical term here epiclesis so um, the use of the word inspired there wasn't actually too much of an accident in the Eucharist in the Eucharist uh, in some theological traditions where we understand the bread and wine to be the real presence of God to 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 be uh, changed in their very foundations there is the moment that is called the epiclesis which is the Holy Spirit entering into the bread and the wine and transforming it so that it becomes the very real presence of God. And so the um, canonic, uh, a canonic ethic, a canonic life, is one of continual epiclesis. It's this continuing action of the Spirit of God coming into us by the grace of God, we are transformed to be the very real presence of God. Not in the, the awe and the majesty and the power and those sorts of things, but rather in the, in, in the same way of Christ, in the, humi in the humility and the obedience. Um, so in this way, we can become like God. So... Um, Humanity, so there's a technical term for that, which is theosis. So theosis just means um, like journeying towards godhood, which sounds very cool and would make a great science fiction or fantasy novel um, or really puff up a person's ego. You know, if, if you were to say to someone, oh, you and I, we are like gods. But remember the picture of God here. So the picture of God that Theosis guides us into is the picture of God who gave, who emptied God of God's of the power and the and the omniscience and, and those sorts of things, and who humbled himself to become to take on the form of a ser a slave, and even to death on a cross. So it's a and that's the Christian journey, I would suggest, is to be like Christ. It's theosis. Uh, that's the technical term. But it, it, it needs to be modified by understanding what is the picture of God in this. So humanity also uh, can participate in, in kind of this journey. Uh, and yeah then part of what is recognized is that there is a, is a mystery in this, a paradox. Because in the emptying ourselves, we find ourselves being filled with divine grace. And so in that, and it, and it becomes a, uh, a mystical experience, so the mystery leads us into the mystical, is the union with God in the self-emptying we we are like God who empties God's self and we are filled with with the love and the canonic spirit and we find union with God in that Whew. now that's not all there is on kenosis but it's a pretty solid introduction I hope uh, I'm just going to quickly check and see if there are any questions or anything like that. Um...
uh, and then we'll go from there. So let me go there. Uh, see how we're going. Because uh, sometimes the, the questions come up on my uh, on my screen, and sometimes they take a little bit, a little bit of time. Uh, all right. Looks like there are no particular questions. That's okay. Um, look, if you have any questions, uh, well, most people who watch this know me, but you can also just put them in the comments and I'll get to them at some stage. Um, yeah, so I'll say, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.